Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. I want to talk today about this showdown, but I'm going to take it a very different direction than most people have online. If you don't know, Dave Shapiro and Gary Marcus have been having it out online recently. Gary Marcus is a notorious bear about AI. Let's just put it that way. I will show you some evidence of that in just a second. But anyway, Stonehead came up with the the sort of perfect, I guess, AI generated like title bout type advertising thing, the AI showdown, Gary Marcus versus David Shapiro. So pretty cool. Anyway, nice job, Stonehead. But the basic basic issue is that David Shapiro has been very optimistic towards AI. If you haven't seen it before, I did an interview with him. Super nice guy. You can check it out up here and I will leave it at the end of this video. And by the way, Gary, no ill will towards you either. If you want to come on my channel, I would love to have you. Actually, we can get into it and it would be really fun. But anyway, two days ago, as I record this, you can see that Gary responded to David Shapiro. Apparently David blocked him. He's not happy about that. But you can see from the blue highlighted part what he called David Shapiro. But anyway, if we go back and look at his recent post, you can see here negative about AGI, negative about AGI, negative about AGI, <laughs> negative about AGI. There is a thing about this beach, wherever that is, that looks like a really lovely place. Negative about AGI, negative about AGI, negative about AGI, negative about AGI, negative about AGI. So anyway, he he basically just posts all the time, trolling AI companies and in particular OpenAI recently because of course they released ChatGPT5. Now, one of the reasons that Gary is trolling AI companies and in particular OpenAI and their ChatGPT5 is that these companies can't produce something that can reason well without tools. He references a recent Apple paper in which Apple showed a mode collapse on complex problems if these LLMs are not allowed to use tools. In other words, if they're only allowed to use their own resources, they collapse eventually. They get to a complexity part where they basically give up. The LLM just kind of goes like, I don't know how to answer this. I'm just going to make up an answer. We'll be confident about that answer and we'll just go with that. So of course that result is really interesting, but what I find intriguing about this is that Gary and these Apple authors and several other people have removed the possibility of utilizing tools as you test for intelligence. And yet human beings, one of the main theories about humans is that we are tool creators. We created tools that at first manipulated the physical environment. I mean, even something like this, this cup, <laughs> right? This manipulates the physical environment. I am able to store water in this and drink from it while I'm in my office recording something for YouTube rather than having to go down to the river and drink out of a stream. That in my mind is is intelligence, right? It takes intelligence to create a tool to be able to allow you to not have to go and drink by the river where the alligators are and the crocodiles and the whatever else. And you could have bugs in the water and all of that kind of stuff. And of course, that's one small example of millions of different kinds of tools, physical tools. And then of course, we moved into mental tools. We have things like pen and paper or pencil and paper. These are obviously tools. They're not digital tools like we're used to now talking about that. But humans have been inventing tools for millennia, for millions of years, possibly even before we had language. It's unclear about that, which came first. The other theory about humans is that we are storytellers. I particularly like that. But honestly, the two of these things go together because you could consider language a type of intellectual tool. It's a way of memorizing and compressing reality into a format that we can remember more easily. Very difficult to look at a tree and just try to remember that exact tree or something. But if you can categorize that into alternating bald cypress, then you can kind of put that in your brain. And next time you see one that looks similar, you can think alternating bald cypress. And that is a way of bootstrapping your intelligence, right? You're not looking at every single tree, trying to figure out what every single tree is. You can put them into a dozen or two dozen categories that are relatively easy to remember. And then obviously we get to digital tools, to more modern tools that we think of. We get to cameras, we get to smartphones, we get to computers, we get to programming languages, is we get to lots and lots of tools that people use on a day-to-day -day basis. Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets or whatnot. All of these things are tools that we all think of as tools, but we humans have been creating tools for a long, long time. And in the animal kingdom, the ability for birds and some primates to be able to build and utilize tools themselves is considered a sign of high intelligence in those creatures. So the intriguing thing for both Gary Marcus's posts and many other people like him who are very, very negative on AI and the potential for artificial general intelligence. And this Apple paper that I'm referencing here, I'll leave a link to this in the description if you're interested in reading it, is that this paper and many critics of artificial intelligence and the potential for AGI remove the possibility of using tools from the quote tool set that these LLMs are allowed to use. In other words, they have to just rely on their own thinking, their own chain of thought, etc. Well, I can tell you that humans would not be particularly intelligent, or at least not to the level that we are, without things like this, right? Without pen, without paper, without 
without stuff like that, we are significantly less intelligent. For example, I had to take the FAA written test for my pilot's license about a month and a half ago. And when I went in, we weren't allowed to take anything in. In fact, I couldn't even wear my watch because I don't know. They were worried I was going to cheat. So all of the tools were removed from me, but instead they gave me a pencil, actually two pencils and some blank scratch paper. And I was allowed to take in a basic calculator that could do flight calculations and a plotter, which is basically a ruler with a round thing on top of it. I was allowed to take these tools in to help me take the test. And as it turned out on several of the questions, I needed one or the other of these tools in order to help me answer the questions. Now, could I have potentially thought my way through all of the questions? Probably I could have gotten somewhat close just using my mind and kind of eyeballing things, but the tools made the difference between me being, you know, maybe 50-50 right about some of the questions that I was asked that involved a lot of calculations and a lot of measurements and a lot of notes that you would have to take, and basically guaranteeing that I answered the question correctly because I had these tools to help me out. So that's just one example of one test amongst millions and millions of tests that happen basically every day for children in school, in elementary school, in high school, in college, and so forth. And most of those tests involve the use of tools, including things like if you have an open book exam, that book becomes a tool. You're able to look through the book to find a particular reference that you're interested in to be able to pull a quote out or something. My son's got an English exam for his senior English class tomorrow, and it's an open book exam. So he's looking through the book that they read over the summer as part of his preparations, right? So these are all just examples of how utilizing tools helps our collective intelligence. We are able to be more intelligent because we have these tools. Humans can calculate much more complex math equations and things like that with a calculator or potentially some code that you wrote on a computer than we can do in our heads. Is it possible for some Rain Man type geniuses to be able to do some of these calculations in their heads? Absolutely. But the common person who is, by the way, considered intelligent, I don't think people are arguing that human beings are not generally intelligent, right? I think that's sort of the bar. That's the benchmark that we're measuring this AI against. And generally speaking, humans are tool users. We use tools to enhance our intelligence and even more intriguingly, of course, we build tools to help our intelligence. So if you're a programmer or you're a creative writer or a tinkerer that builds things in the basement or the garage or something, all of those things are you building tools yourself. You're creating things that help you to explore whatever it is that you want to explore or to solve a problem you want to solve. These are all activities of tool building that indicate intelligence and it bootstraps our intelligence. Society is collectively far more intelligent than we were a century ago just in the sense of astronomy or something, right? Just as one tiny little niche application, we've built gigantic telescopes on the ground. We've put telescopes in space. We've sent space probes to planets and things. We know so much more about the universe in 2025 than we did in 1925 that it's just kind of ridiculous. I mean, Hubble was just discovering the Hubble constant, the fact that galaxies were going away from us. In fact, that galaxies even existed outside of our galaxy 100 years ago. So we have come a very, very long way in 100 years, and that's precisely because of tools. It's not like humans have gotten any smarter. It's just that we have better tools and better data and better information. So I'll circle back to the question of why is Gary Marcus, why are these authors at Apple, why are other critics of artificial intelligence disallowing the use of tools when they are tasking AI with trying to prove that it can solve complex problems and it can demonstrate intelligence? That is a really intriguing question. I'm not exactly sure why. Again, I would say that human beings are tool users. And if you took away our tools, we're going to be significantly less smart than we are with our tools. And what we're seeing here is the exact same thing with large language models. We're seeing them be less intelligent without tools than they are with tools. That seems like a fairly obvious state of affairs that any intelligence is going to be more intelligent if you give it access to tools. And of course, in this Apple paper, it becomes really interesting that the LLMs basically give up at a certain level of complexity if they don't have access to tools. If you give them access to tools, they're able to handle very complex problems. If you don't, they eventually kind of give up and just BS an answer, which sounds an awful lot like humans again. If you ask a person without a phone on them or without Google, if you ask them a complicated question that they don't know the answer to, some people will just be like, I don't know the answer. Other people will just make something up. So in a weird way, these large language models sound a lot like biologically intelligent species like us, that if you give us something that's too complex, we'll either give up or we'll make something up rather than having the right answer if you disallow us from using tools. So those are my thoughts on the topic. If any of the Apple authors or if Gary Marcus or if all of the above want to come on my channel and have a quick chat about this. I would love to hear your thoughts and why you contend that LLMs are not allowed to use tools in order to demonstrate the maximum amount of intelligence that they have. I, of course, might be missing something, and I am not by any means claiming that chat 
ChatGPT-5 is artificially generally intelligent by any current definition of that term, but I do feel that tool use is an indication of intelligence, bootstraps intelligence, and the fact that one is able to build tools and these LLMs are able to create programs, which is essentially building tools to help them be smarter, seems to me to demonstrate some level of intelligence. Alrighty, folks, that's what I've got for this episode. Let me know in the comments what you think about all of this. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video, it helps YouTube's neural networks and their algorithms to show it to more people. So thank you very much. And please consider subscribing for more of this kind of content. In the meantime, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.